I think Sorry? there's someone having uh, who is like, and they have music on, so I'm not sure if you hear it on your side. Oh, okay. All right, fine. Okay, let me just go ahead with 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 the intro quickly. Sure. Um. So um, thank you all for coming for the, to the next Einstein Fellows um, webinar sessions. Um, so this is something that we've been doing for, for the past few months. Um, and um, so we've been doing it for a few months um, and we've had a few of our NET Fellows come and present the work that they do, which is really amazing. And today we are very happy to have Dr. Jackson Mahakalala here with us. So just a quick intro of who he is. He's a um, faculty member and Wellcome Trust Intermediate Fellow at Africa Health Research Institute. He's also an associate professor at University College London's Division of Infection and Immunity. He's um, an honorary research associate at the University of Cape Town and a visiting scientist at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health, Department of Immunology and Infectious Disease. So he has a PhD in chemical pathology from UCT, and um, and also he did a postdoctoral fellowship uh, in immunity at UCT Institute of Infectious Disease and Molecular Medicine. So today in his talk, he's going to be talking about uh, tuberculosis. The title of the talk is Tuberculosis Host Directed Therapies Targeting Lung Pathological Damage. So, um, he will mostly be talking about the need to develop new diagnostic and therapeutic strategies to curb TB transmissions. So, with no further ado, thank you, Dr. Jackson, for, for accepting to do this talk. And I'll let you take the floor and, um, and really tell us about your work. Thank you. Um. Thank you very much, Esther. Um, I really appreciate this great opportunity to talk to, you know, to people in the comforts of their homes, you know, as the, as the new normal now with the COVID-19 situation. And uh, during your introduction, I realized you omitted NEF, which I think has been very instrumental to many young scientists in the continent in terms of actually trying to make our science more available at community level and to see how we can actually use science to advocate you know change across the continent even at political level so personally as a NEF fellow one of the first NEF fellow one of the first NEF fellows i'm really really indebted to to next einstein forum for all they've done for many many young scientists in the continent so today and again thanks for that kind introduction so today i'll be talking about uh, a disease that's well known because it has uh, one of the most severe burdens on our continent in Africa. So it's called TB. Because the audience is very broad, so I'm going to try and 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 be sort of try and be accommodating in terms of uh, describing things. So bear with me for those who are really specialists, for example, in the area. So we'll be talking about a lung disease called TB and how we can actually develop new therapies that are actually aimed at, at the host or at the human rather than aimed at the bacteria alone. So I'm based at Africa Health Research Institute, as they said, our laboratories here, but uh, by affiliation, I'm with the University College London Division of Infection and Immunity. So uh, just an introduction to what ARI or Africa Health Research Institute is all about. It's basically a research independent research facility that is actually funded largely by Wellcome Trust and has strong collaborations or link with University of Kwazulu Natal, Nelson Mandela School of Medicine, as well as University College London in the UK. And we have two campuses. One is based in Durban SEC on the right, uh, with, sorry, where we have a lot of laboratory research going on, working on clinical samples. We largely work on HIV and TB. And then we also have a campus that is in a rural village in Songkele, Juba Juba. It's about 230 kilometers north of Durban. So this is where clinical samples are collected in various forms, blood, you know, like urine, sputum, and we also do hypertension testing, diabetes testing, HIV testing, as well as TB testing. And these two centers work together in harmony to try and use 
lab facilities to address challenges that are affecting our populations with an aim of actually designing interventions that are tailor-made for the challenges that are relevant locally. So that's what Africa Health Research Institute stands for. So my laboratory is also here at um, in this in this campus, uh, in Durban campus. So TB to many people doesn't need introduction, but we know that uh, it's a disease that is actually tormented uh, mankind for, 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 for centuries. In fact, as people can remember, back into Greek philosophy, people like Hippocrates actually have actually described something that's consistent with what we know as modern TB and from Egyptian mummies and so on. So this is a disease that has been around for a very, very long time. And the bacterium that caused the disease is called Mycobacterium tuberculosis, which was discovered like around 1882 or so. Um, and it was discovered and hopefully by then the discovery opened opportunities for us to discover new tools to, to, to eradicate the disease. So around 1942, 19, up to 1952 or so, like first drugs started coming out, starting with streptomycin. Um, and then um, around the 60s, there were like four, four drugs that were already working efficiently against TB. However, they were all marked by, by a problem of drug resistance. So, 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 between then, the 60s and now, we haven't really had a great success in developing new drugs that are coming out. But that said, uh, so the progress in the TB field has been really slow in terms of urgency, in terms of actual investment deeper into developing tools and so on. But there's a lot of exciting research going in recent times. Uh, so despite all this research that has been going on for centuries and so on, so TB remains one of the the, the deadliest, one of the most um, problem, problems of our society. So it's, it's still responsible for over 1.5 million people, more, more than 1.5 million lives lost every year. And largely because it's compounded to drug resistance. And in situations where we have increasing immunocompromised individuals, for instance, people who are not on HIV treatment, for instance, who might actually be, be, be prone to, to severe symptoms of TB. Uh, so, so basically, the major problem to TB is actually compounded to co-infection as well as as increasing strains of the of, of the bacterium. So, this is a report from 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 World Health Organization indicating the challenges I mentioned, linking drug antimicrobial resistance and also breaking it between uh, men, women, and children, and how we're doing actually, as you can see this. So, TB remains a problem, but we are very hopeful that we. We, with, with efforts, one would, would, would actually see the disease eradicated in our lifetime, but we don't know uh, whether with the current tools we have sufficient, we have sufficient uh, material to really get rid of the disease. But I can tell you that one of the key things we need is more an efficient vaccine. At the moment, we only have one vaccine called BCG that works good for kids, especially against severe forms of TB, like TB meningitis, but in adults, it's not very effective. So we really need a vaccine. Another thing we need, we need tools to diagnose TB earlier. So as it is, TB is diagnosed more by sputum. When someone coughs, someone has TB in their lung when they cough and they test for the presence of the bacteria. That's when someone is diagnosed of TB. But by then, I think it's more like endpoint when someone actually has damage already in the lung, some of the people and so on. So we need to find the so-called biomarkers that can assist people to identify people earlier to know that this person is on the brink of developing TB. So let's start treating them, for instance. So there's a need for diagnostics, there's a need for vaccine. And finally, because I mentioned that the current TB drugs we have also have a problem or a challenge of drug resistance, we also need to find uh, better interventions to develop new therapies that can benefit people who respond poorly to current treatment protocols. So talking of new treatments, so my idea or work that we're interested in is to develop drugs that will help current first-line drugs. So the current first-line drugs, for example, are targeting the bacteria, they try and kill the bacteria. But as I mentioned, TB is the disease of the lung. So we also want to, while killing the bacteria, we also want to treat the, 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 the damage or things that cause the damage in our lungs so that 
we can have a, an adjunct or a joint effect where you actually limit lung, lung damage and as well as kill bacteria. So that way we think like uh, with adjunct therapies, it would come with solutions. I'll talk more in detail about that. So as I mentioned, uh, so TB basically uh, is something that for a long time people have looked at as latent TB and active TB. Active TB meaning that someone has the disease and they cough sputum that has, when they cough, they have bacteria in their sputum. And then latent TB would mean that someone is exposed to the bacteria, they have bacteria in their lung, but they are not sick, they don't have the disease. In fact, of the seven to eight billion people we have in the world, a third of these people, like about two billion, have bacteria, the bacteria that cause TB in their, in their lungs. But only about five to 10% of those people will, only de will develop the active disease in their lifetime. So the rest, we don't know how they are protected, but we believe that an intact good immune system is what's key to protecting these people who have bacteria in the lung, but they don't develop the disease. So at the moment, we have started appreciating that it's not just a binary thing where one has latent TB and as well as active, active TB. We believe there's actually a spectrum and there's also things happening in between latency and as well as active TB. And if you are able to, like for instance, there's something called subclinical TB, where people like work, exciting work, some of it coming from South Africa, but with great colleagues throughout the world working on, on developing biomarkers that predict the risk of developing TB like as early as, in some instances, as early as 200 days before someone, before the onset of the disease, some people are already having genes that go up indicating that this person is at risk of getting TB. So that would be really great for intervention. So uh, the, to get better things that I talked about, more like biomarkers, and as well as to get uh, therapies that are targeting lung damage, we look at a structure called granuloma. So granuloma is basically an aggregate or a, a yeah, so it's, it's, it's a layer of multiple cells that come together of our immune system when they see the bacteria that is actually inhaled into, into spaces in our lungs called alveolar sacs. So basically when bacteria are inhaled, when someone calls to have the disease, that bacteria migrates into our spaces in our lungs where they interact with our immune cells. Some are called macrophages and so on that are the first, for example. And then we also have cells like T cells and so on that come and actually surround the bacteria. So this surrounding thing is called granuloma or called tubercle. So the discovery of TB in 1882, basically Robert Koch crushed this tubercle that came from a TB patient. And then when he cultured this and he found that the bacteria grew, that's when we knew that there was actually a bacteria that is responsible for this change in the lung, the pathological change in the lung called granuloma. So a granuloma is actually a hallmark of pathological change in the lung as a result of TB infection. But then uh, granulomas are also still something that's that we don't really understand well. We believe that a good granuloma, a solid granuloma, like I show you here in this structure, this cartoon, it contains, it helps contain bacteria at the center. So you can look at it that it helps stop the spread of the bacteria by containing it. But we're not sure what happens, what's the fate of the bacteria, what's, what's the role and so on. Uh, but we believe that a good solid granuloma is good, that even if people are latent infected, the bacteria are well contained by these competent cells in form of a granuloma. However, granuloma, as you can see this structure, on the right here, you can see when a granuloma is formed, this is more like a primary solid granuloma that we believe is containing and everything is in trapped structure. These are just more like cartoon structures and models, basically, but they help us understand. So during latency, we believe that's when uh, when, when uh, there's a lot of a mix of granulomas, largely there's a formation of a cassium uh, in, the, in the center of the structure. So cassium is that cheese-like structure in a lung that actually forms in the middle of a granuloma. So this actually structure called cassium, when it forms, it can actually liquefy and it can fall off to lead into cavities in the same granuloma. So when cavities are formed, remember that the bacteria is contained, the bacteria are contained at the center of these granulomas. So when you are at the cavitation level where the cavities have developed in granulomas, now one now is at high risk of now disseminating bacteria throughout the lung. And also, as you remember, that granulomas also likely come 
the, the lung is actually an airway, it's linked to the airway. So basically the bacteria that are actually in the granulomas are now coughed out. And then that's where transmission is happening. So we're looking at a granuloma as a tool that is important to contain bacteria. But if it loses its intact desirable structure, it becomes cachetted and it forms cavities and then it helps transmission. So in order to keep transmission on the spectrum of TB, one of the things we need to do is to check how actually the damage happens in the lung and how the granuloma actually starts losing its intact desirable structure to form cavities and so on. And what are the factors that drive these processes? And are those factors, can they be exploited to develop therapies that block inflammation, for instance? So that's the idea of what we do. As I mentioned, so at ARI, including my group, we, we work on, on discovering, using discovery basic research to determine disease or to discover disease determinants, which we use then to develop new tools and as well as things that can go into early phase trials. So in this case, I'm interested in identifying, as I showed you, molecular drivers of TB progression in the lung. So what are the molecular things that drive progression of that granuloma, that damage to really happen? What are the things that we can identify? And can we have evaluate those things as the promoters of pathological damage as targets for? For, for, for therapy, a therapy that would actually limit lung damage. And then finally, those things can actually enter into preclinical models and can enter later. If, if they work well, they can work into trials and so on. So this is the theme of our work. And then now to get into what really triggered our interest in this um, or the work that we've already done. So I'll talk about a mixture of things largely that we have already published and things that are actually ongoing in the lab and also out in there. So what we know is that, as, as I mentioned, these are just like histological structures of cartoons I showed you of a granuloma. So this granuloma is a solid granuloma, but it can form a cashium here at the center. And a cashium can lead to cavitation, as you can see here. And then a cavitation, as I mentioned, is a driver. This stage is where the bacteria are disseminated and so on. So to ask, uh, to start with the aim of identifying molecular drivers of this process, the spectrum of pathological damage, from a good one all the way to a worst one, we wanted to dissect different regions in these different forms of granulomas and identify all proteins that are associated with different stages of the damage. So with the hope that when you dissect these pieces of the lung here, and these pieces of the lung here in different regions and these pieces of the lung, and then you run something called mass spec and then you identify proteins that come out and associated with each stage, then you can actually tell these are the proteins that are associated with the damage. So that's what we did in the first work that we did previously. And then, um, uh, for instance, I want to tell, I want to go into very deep, deeper jargon, but I want to tell, so what actually the proteomics I showed you help you is to really identify, uh, like, as I mentioned, drivers of that are associated with pathology. So here, for instance, we find things that are called pathways. So there's this pathway where you have a molecule called arachidonic acid that can lead to another molecule that is called leukotriene A4 that leads to leukotriene B4. And leukotriene B4 is known to be highly inflammatory, for example. So it's by nature is something that's driving inflammation, for example. So for this arachidonic acid to come all the way here, there are two enzymes, for example, involved. One is called LOX5 or ALOX5. And then this one is called LTA4H. So these are the enzymes that lead to inflammatory mediators release. And then we found that from the proteomics, we found that in red here, red means high and then blue is low. So we found that these proteins like ALOX5 and as well as LT4H, another related en enzyme also called ALOX E5P, they were, they were actually associated with the damaged area in cashiums that I showed in granulomas. And they were lower in cells. Cells are more solid granulomas where you have like intact cellular regions. But when you no longer have intact cellular regions, you start having cachiation and cavitation. You see so much of these proteins going up, including LX5 in blue and LT48. So these are prediction studies. So if we want to confirm the trueness of that high expression or high increase of that protein, you go to the tissues and then you get an immunological antibody that reacts to the presence of that protein. And then as you can see here in red is a representation of a piece of lung with a little cavity 
and acacia I'm here inside. And then in green, we basically, in blue is basically staying for all cells that have a nucleus, for example, live cells and so on. Uh, and then here, we actually have this protein here just to validate whether it's associated with caseation. And we find that it lights up here in green, as you can see around the caseums here, and not much in cellular regions where you actually have DAPI, for instance, which is actually all cells. So what this tells us is that this indeed is associated with caseums, for instance, and you can do for all forms of granuloma. So basically when you look in a person's lung, there's so much of her heterogeneity. So TB is a heterogeneous disease that even within the same person, you see like lots and small granulomas, you see fibrotic granulomas, caseous granulomas, cavitary, and other granulomas that are solid. So what we saw here, we just wanted to see whether you can see consistency in the expression of those proteins that I showed you, LX5 and LTA4A in this pathway as predicted by the, the bigger study where we wanted to determine drivers of inflammation. And you can see here when, when this square, where the square is, and then you see a calcium at the center here. So on the edges, again, LT4H on the edges here is actually green. You can see where it's lighting up exactly where you actually have the edges surrounding the calcium, not much in cellular when you have the things in blue. And then you have a small granuloma here that's nascent and forming, and then with the calcium at the center. So it's largely the edges not much in the cellular here, but just at the edges surrounding granulomas. And then we have a cavitary granuloma that actually has a solid area in here. And then inside necrotic material, which we assume remained when the calcium fell off, you actually see it here in this area in green as opposed to like cellular regions. And also LOX5, which is a cousin of this, or actually something that's operating the same pathway upstream, is also not as much as as a LTA for age is also biased towards those areas, but more so also in the calcium, for example, where you start cavitation forming. So what we found is that these proteins indeed associate, associate with caseation and not much sparsely so with, with cellular regions. And um, and uh, because I told you about inflammation, that the idea of whole therapy therapies, I actually meant to reduce inflammation. So what our studies showed is that inflammation, as expected to many people, that inflammation, if it's too much, it's not good. So inflammation um, can lead to lung damage. And then, and we found that indeed, formation of caseums and cavitation coincides with increase of molecules that promote inflammation, for example, like the two that I've showed you. And one of the most famous molecules that is inflammatory by nature is called TNF here. So on this molecule, TNF is in red, and we wanted to see whether we can correlate on the lung the TNF, this inflammatory mediator, together with a protein that I've already showed you that consisted, consistently showed with the edges of the calcium. So here you can see LTA4A is green lighting up, around surrounding the cavity and the calcium is here and then you see that it's actually colocalizes with gnf in many ways so the gnf is not as abundant as lt for age but regionally locally they seem to really be operating in the same area uh, suggesting an association at tissue level between lt for age and the release of tnf which is inflammatory by nature and in addition to this i've already showed how can protein or how proteins that are associated with the damage, how one can detect that by imaging and straining. But these proteins, as I showed you, they operate on metabolites or on substrates to release metabolites and so on. So one thing that we did, so we worked with many people in this project. For example, here we're lucky to work with the laboratory of Veronique Tatoire at New Jersey. So other things we did with Eric Rubin at Harvard, that's where I sort of, sort of started this work. And it's a project that I was leading. I was lucky to have collaborators like Veronique Tatoire at New Jersey uh, State University and, and people like Cliff Berry who gave us tissues then. But what, what some data from Veronique Tatoire's lab showed that we're doing together, showed that you can also use mass spec imaging that image is metabolites based on ionic mass. So basically based on, on molecular mass of a particular, particular metabolite, you can actually image on a tissue. So in these images, this is an, in red, you can see on the left, it's actually a, a granuloma with a cavity in the middle. And then these are the edges again. So we find that molecules like arachidonic acid that I showed you that is metabolized by those proteins like five locks. Basically, arachidonic acid is metabolized by five locks, 
that I showed you, LX5 as well, LTA for edge downstream that associated with inflammation. It's also largely imaged on the edges. And then on the left side, arachidonic acid can also be used by other molecules called COXs, like COX1 and COX2, which generally can lead to more like a response that counteract too much inflammation on the right here. So arachidonic acid itself as a, as a, as a substrate it can be utilized either on the right by inflammatory mediators like LOXIS LT4H pathways, leading to too much damage and so on, or on the left here utilized by COXIS like COX2 and COX1 that can counteract too much inflammation. So one thing we wanted to show now is something called speciality. So what's really key with the granulomas from humans, unfortunately, is that it's a snapshot of an event. So it's a, they're taken from surgery when people have severe lung damage and the surgery recommended for them to have the damaged lung removed. That's where we have an opportunity to work on those tissues. We don't know what happens afterwards. We don't know what happened before. So it's just a snapshot at that time, point in time. So the only thing that can work is really, especially is one of the things where we can associate things over space as it is. And temporarily it would be really great, but one would need models of granulomas where you can work over time and observe this kinetics or dynamics of events. But one thing we appreciate with the human lung and also with the structure of a granuloma is that having a cesium and having a layer around the cesium and having a cellular region on the edges. So if you have markers and tools and antibodies, you can actually detect spatiality of events. And just using what I told you as an example that arachidonic acid here can be utilized by coxes that are largely anti-inflammatory. Um, and then uh, and the loxes that I showed you that are largely inflammatory, as I showed you, and they're related to TNFs and so on. So we actually went using like immunofluorescence here, which again stands for the for particular protein. So basically, on the left, you have COX, which is uh, on the left arachidonic acid here. You actually see that COXs they are in red here. I don't know if you can see my cursor. So although it's not, not, not much, so the, in the middle here is a cesium, and then you have like a layer, like a damaged layer, which is highly inflammatory layer. And then you have cellular regions in blue and rich in cellular regions. You see that coxes are here on the outside. And then when you look actually at five logs, that's highly inflammatory, as I showed you, it's not much here as opposed to coxes. It's not much, but it's in the regions where you have the damage. This is the red part, and to some extent, to the, to the cesium. So this shows that you can actually even determine events spatially. But what's interesting in the context of this pathway that I picked as an example is that you actually have inflammatory mediators that are inside here, immediately bordering, bordering a cesium that is more like a damaged lung. So, and this is where the edge of the damage is happening. And one would assume that if you were to look over time, perhaps this is the expansion of the damage. Whereas coxes are on the outside, immediately surrounding this layer here. So they're here, but not in the damaged region. So firstly, we know that what we can suggest, this is loxes, for example, are mark of lung damage. As you can see, mark of inflammation. And we probably think they might be driving that inflammation. But then, Lock coxes are surrounding them. So what 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 does this mean? We don't know because we can work. We don't know what happens after this. But what's key? One can probably like hypothesize that perhaps anti-inflammatory mediators are working by sequestering inflammation, sort of squeezing in and blocking the growth of the damage. And then who wins? I think is what actually tips whether the damage continues or not. But I think what's really important is to understand the balance of these events. One can use pharmaceutical inhibitors. That's where host-directed therapies that target lung inflammation would come in if you actually have molecules that target these pathways, for instance. So here's just to show in detail, like in red here, it's like coxes here. This is not loxes, and then outside is where we have the, the cells that actually like intact. So this is just an association of the damage at a higher resolution, for instance, at, at a higher zoomed. So what I've showed you so far is that we can actually take advantage of lungs that come from surgery in patients who had undergone surgery because of severe damage in TB. And we can use those tissues to identify drivers of inflammation, like number of proteins at different levels of pathological damage. And then we can validate that by immunohistochemistry using antibodies. And you can also evaluate uh, for instance, you can actually sort of also do the spatial characterization and on the space using um, 
using like immunofluorescence and so on. And you can also use tools like imaging, like mass spec imaging to correlate metabolites along the proteins, they function together. But this is actually happening in the lung. And as I showed you, one person can have all these things happening together at the same time, right? Because I mentioned that granulomas can be heterogeneous in, one's in, in, in one lung. For example, one person having TB, they can have solid granulomas as well as caseous granulomas at the same time. So, but how is this now going to translate into the clinical progression of the disease? So to test whether we can claim that molecules that are associated with severe forms of TB like cavities and KTMs that we, I showed you, to test whether these molecules translate to association with clinical progression of the disease. In a clinical format, we go to patients and look at blood and also to check whether those things that we see in the lung can correlate to what we see in the blood. Because if you want to develop a biomarker, you want something that you cannot go and take someone's lung to diagnose their TB, right? So you need to take something, for instance, from blood that mirrors changes in the lung. So here we just ambitiously wanted to see whether things that we see in the lung can mirror changes in the presence of the same protein in blood. So what we did here was to basically collect blood from, from different people who have different stages of the disease. But to cut long story short, we looked at the multiple proteins that we're interested in in the lab at gene level. But then here we looked at the, I'll just focus on the ones that I showed you. So when you actually go back to the pathways of our interest at the back that I showed you, when you look at coxes that were not associated with the inflammation and the damage, but they are on the outside in normal cellular regions, and then you have healthy people. So healthy people is people who don't have TB at all, TB infection at all. And then latent TB are those that don't have TB disease, but when you test them with a with a test called interferon gamma release assay, they test positive for the presence of bacteria in their system. So they are latently infected. And then you have TB patients. And then when you just, these are just pilots. So when you actually test for coxes, for example, as I showed you, coxes were not highly associated with the disease, not associated with the disease in the lung. And then also here, cox TN1, you don't see significant differences. So one dot represents a, per a, per a person. So you don't see significant differences between groups, but using the same per patients, for instance, and then you look at LOX5 and LT4H, which are the molecules that I showed you throughout, you find that actually in TB, like ALOX5 goes very, very high. So the expression of ALOX5 with the arrival of TB disease is very high as compared to healthy and latent TB. And as well as LT4H is very, very high, the expression of this gene. So indicating that compared to healthy. So this indicates that what we see in the tissue, the correlation of tissue damage or pathological damage to those molecules also can actually be recapitulated in the blood, indicating these are molecules that one can exploit further to see whether you can develop detection, for example, using this and so on. I mean, this is an addition of a lot of work that's going on out there with very proven molecules that actually uh, are potential biomarkers. But this, for instance, using these methods, one can develop and go further. So what, what um, I, I've showed you is that now we have these proteins in, in calcium, for instance, in blood, but that's all we know is an association. One cannot claim that they are causing the disease. And in fact, the, the problem of actually having things that go high with the disease, you don't know whether they go high because of an effect of the disease itself, or they go high because they cause the disease themselves, or they go high because they're trying to eliminate the bacteria and they're just caught in action at the time we, we, we detect them. So those things are very difficult to, 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 to follow. But I think he key tools that we need to address these questions of cause or effect is genetics. For example, if you have, there are humans that may have changes or some mutations, things called mutations, polymorphisms in the regions of these genes. So if those people are, are identified and then we have polymorphisms in those genes, then we could actually do an association with the disease to see whether there's causality. But that's very difficult. Uh, so what we do in the labs, for instance, uh, we do, one could also do mouse work where they have like knockouts in particular genes and then to see whether the absence of that gene renders that those mice more susceptible or they control TB better. But in our case, we actually use macrophage model. Macrophages are not the perfect model for the things that we see, for example, in a granuloma because it doesn't represent a complex network of interaction of different cells. 
but they, it's a good start because they are easy to manipulate in terms of knocking down or in terms of overexpressing. One can actually read out also inflammatory responses in macrophages. It's also things that are related to tissue death in things that you can use as cell death, for instance. So what we do basically, we to evaluate molecules that target the proteins I showed you. So as I showed you, those proteins that we think are driving disease inflammation in the lung and disease progression in blood, for example, we believe that by targeting them with pharmaceutical drugs, we will reduce inflammation. And if you reduce inflammation earlier on before the onset of the disease, then the mycobacteria, the bacteria in the lung, won't get a chance to spread throughout the lung. So if you get drugs that limit inflammation early on, and then you come with first-line drugs where you find TB that's still contained in solid granules, for example, we believe will actually eliminate TB quickly. So you'll basically, I think, you'll shorten treatment course because by the time you start treatment, when someone is already having damage and a lot of bacteria in the lung, it takes at least six months. This new developments now showing that one can shorten to four months, for example, recently. But treatment, six months is still minimum required time for TB treatment. And that actually is probably the reason why other people default, other people stop treatment because it's a long period of time, commitment. So one of the the things that we can actually hope will change the, 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 the fight against TB is if we can shorten therapy. And I think shortening therapy would actually benefit a lot if we combine host-directed therapies that limit inflammatory drivers together with first-line drugs that limit bacterial growth. So here we're interested in host-directed therapies on the molecules, for instance, I showed you, and other molecules that we discovered in those pathways that I may not show here because of time. But this is just a pathway I showed you, but there's more that we're doing. So what we do, investigate whether we can target a particular protein, as I showed you, and then infect macrophages with mycobacterium tuberculosis, and then study things like inflammatory responses, cell death, as well as the bacteria themselves, whether they grow or they go down. So here is an example of what I showed you. This is a data that focused on one of these molecules here, the three that I showed you earlier on. And then we used the pharmaceutical drugs that is available that we buy. And then so when you treat macrophages with this drug, you find that when you start here, when macrophages are not, in, un, are not treated, you actually have little cell death here. And then when you treat macrophages with a drug alone, also there isn't much cell death. But when you treat macrophages with bacteria that causes TB, mycobacterium tuberculosis, cell death goes very high. But then when you actually have the drug that limits that inflammation that I showed in the lung, together with TB, you reduce the TB-mediated inflammation here, I mean cell death. And then also, but these are very modest changes, they're not very high, but this is just a proof of concept that you can reduce cell death. But then the concept of actual host-directed therapy is also always linked to something that we're interested in. I'm not talking about it today much, but we're interested more on reproposing drugs. So reproposing means a drug that is already approved for something else, and then it works. For example, if it's a drug that's approved for inflammatory disease, and you use it against TB because it helps lessen the TB-associated inflammation. So that won't take the long process that are involved in FDA approval and so on, and they'll come in handy. So here's an example of a, we have a drug in the lab that we found that it targets a molecule of interest that we've been working on for a while. It's called sick kinase. So in TB versus healthy, we find that sick in blood is very high compared to healthy donors, for instance. So indicating that sick, for instance, is similar. It's just a different pathway. Here I just want to, to test and just to show you the, 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 the approach on, on, um, on repurposed drugs. So, for instance, when you look at sick to validate the changes of sick when the disease comes, we now what's nice about new with with data availability. There's also some work that publishes. For example, if we go to to something called uh, Gene um, Expression Omnibus on PubMed, you can actually pick what's available out there and actually analyze an available data on the expression of your gene of interest. For instance, the gene set here, when you actually sort of validated the expression of sick, we found that in healthy, basically sick is lower and in latent TB, but with the arrival of TB, it goes very high. So it actually validates what we see in our own experiments, basically that sick actually goes like it's, it's the fall change of almost 100 times, for instance. So here, um, what is really nice about the available data that is that actually even in people who are treated for TB, 
when the disease actually, when you, you sort of follow sick after they are diagnosed with the disease, you see that sick is very high, basic kinase, the gene, and it goes down at six months when people have actually recovered from TB. So this indicates that TB sick might be a mark of disease severity because it's low in absence of the disease. It's also low in latent TB. It, becomes very, it becomes very high in the worst condition of the disease. And when the disease goes away because of treatment, it goes to low. So sick is what we're interested in. And here is a snapshot of our data, so which we, 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 we are excited about, um, is that actually when you look at day one and day two, for example, in macrophages infected with Mycobacterium tuberculosis. Here again is the, is the cells alone. Here is the cells with the drug alone. There are no changes. And then here is the cells with TB causing bacteria. And you see that um, an inflammatory molecule, TNF, as I showed you, it's actually very high. But when you add this molecule that is actually repurposed from a disease, so this is a molecule that is used to treat a disease called um, immunothrombocytopenia. So this is a disease of, of, of blood, platelets, and so on. We don't know the connection, but what's interesting is that this molecule targets a gene of our interest and is already approved for a different disease. So we are reproposing it for TB. As you can see here, it takes down in TNF mediated inflammation. So in macrophages, you can see again, even at day three, that uh, the treatment of these reproposed drugs take inflammation down measured by TNF. And it also correlates to, to rescued cell death where you have TB going up with cell death and which is then rescued when you add this molecule. So far we know of a molecule that's approved for a different disease and we repurpose it to target a gene that we saw that is associated with disease severity. And when you repurpose, you find that it limits inflammation, it limits cell death, and then we checked whether it's associated with bacteria. So when you look at untreated macrophages, you have, sorry, when you have macrophages infected with mycobacteria and you measure the amount of the bacteria inside the macrophages, you see that actually this is the number here is high, it's over a million as you can see. But when you have first, when you have this molecule that targets sick, for instance, it actually reduces bacterial burdens, which to our, was to our surprise because we actually were thinking that this is, we didn't have a direct effect on the bacteria itself. But here it's exciting, it actually takes down the bacteria. And also we wanted to see whether, this is rifampicin and isoniazid that are used as first line drugs of TB. We wanted to see if we use it to get, use isoniazid and use isoniazid and rifampicin together with fostamatin, it would have a synergistic effect. But it doesn't seem to be operating in synergy when it's uh, combined with first line drugs. But in itself, we see that this molecule, for example, that's reproposed, takes down cell death and inflammation and then is associated with the disease and also takes down the bacteria. So this is just a proof of concept that I've been telling you throughout that sick, uh, that, that there's pathways that are associated with inflammation at tissue level and at blood level can also be used as biomarkers of disease severity. Some of them may be driving disease progression and then if they drive it, it can intercept with available pharmaceutical inhibitors that can be repurposed to block inflammation and help first line drugs eliminate TB quicker. So these are basically the conclusions that, that, that we have, that you can, you can manipulate the information that we have based on what's happening in the lung, based on what's happening in the blood as disease progresses, and then we can understand what pathways whether they cause the disease or it's, a, it's an effect. If they cause the disease, we can get the drugs that are available as first line drugs. I mean, and together first line drugs and then get into preclinical models. So that was what we, we involved with. And as I mentioned, the development stage of also can be followed by delivery in the real world evaluation influencing policy. This is not our operational uh, sort of space, but I think when we develop molecules like this, we can actually help and then feed into engagements with policymakers to see how actually integration of new biomarkers and host directed therapies into diagnostic and treatment protocols can occur. But this is, I think, comes from efforts, people working all over together with funders, researchers, clinical basic level, as well as population level and commitment from governments. And talking of commitment from governments, I want to quickly talk about what we learned from COVID-19 that while COVID-19 actually, we have lost a lot of lives and everything, but one would agree that this is the first time that the world has come together to identify a common challenge that we really, really want to, to get rid of. So one thing we have to appreciate is the rapid response that yielded desirable results. For me, desirable results is the fact that we 
we sort of uh, like for instance in South Africa we we with with what actually was institutionalized or was but at national level there was actually like lockdown from level one to five so I think we saved a lot of lives and sort of we kept a lot of spread from there I know at economy level we didn't do well and everything but I think the way the world responded as a unit it shows the power of global collaboration but also the urgency and it also shows that awareness and advocacy is important because everyone now waking up, they check what's the statistics on COVID-19. And journals right now, they're even making freely available any publication that has to do with COVID-19, which is very, very exciting things that we appreciate. And others are actually even free and so on. And then, so what we learn from COVID-19 to make and shape our preparedness for future potential outbreaks. But I think in the context of TBS, I showed you that it's been with us for centuries and we lose over 1.5 million deaths every year. I think it warrants the same urgency that what we saw with the COVID-19 response we can actually give to TB2 and other diseases, of course. But this is just something that at advocacy level, I think could be considered. So I'm very fortunate to work with multiple collaborators, as I mentioned, a lot of work I talked about here, some of it's published, some are not. And then, but I worked a lot. I was lucky to have mentors like Prof. Eric J. Rubin at Harvard School of Public Health. And then I had a lot of collaborators, as I mentioned. Like, I also got to spend some time at Max Planck in Germany, where I learned to do, we did mass spec in those proteomics I showed you in the imaging as well, with the likes of Veronique Datoir and um, Alessio at, and then Brendan Prado at New Jersey Radka State University. And um, and I worked at UCT. So on the right here is my group, people, my colleagues that I worked with at UCT that we, we really worked well together. And um, yeah, so they are still colleagues. So I, I still maintain some of the, the lab there. And then University College London is my main employer. So my permanent position is with them and I always appreciate their support. And Harvard School of Public Health is always my second home and also having my mentor there and career development mentors there. And uh, my lab at Ari is people on the left here that I'm very, very happy and lucky to work with. So Karishka, Rajkumar, Janelle, Timon, Fisher, Tabum Poche, as well as Stuart Moore. So this is our group. Stuart is more like a, is, is a nuclear physician. So he's actually working on imaging. So his PhD work is looking at imaging. So he's working at Red Cross Children's Hospital. So he's not really based at Ari, but he's a visiting student because I'm his supervisor, course supervisor. So he's a visiting uh, colleague in my lab. So, and I appreciate funders from my main funds is from Welcome Trust and Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, but in Cape Town, I'm sponsored by South African Medical Research Council. And I, I got some funding previously from National Research Foundation. And I also appreciate a lot of colleagues from ARI here, like the labs that we work with. So we have people like, uh, like Prof. Audrey Stein, where we're going to work together on tissues, people like Al Leslie and, and all others that are actually uh, through their studies, I'm getting access to blood samples and and, and, and the entire RE like uh, that we we work with here. It's, it's a great blessing to be in a place that's so invested in towards towards addressing a challenge that's so relevant to 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 local, you know, to Africa. Uh, and thank you. So I'll stop there. So these are funders and everything. And if there are questions, I appreciate, well, um, actually, when we started, I can't say when we started, so I was appointed a fellow in 2015 when the next Einstein Foundry Forum was started. So I really benefited from great, great interaction, even at highest level, meeting presidents and uh, of different countries, going to World Economic Forum, and I think NEF has been a very great instrument in driving change and promoting science in all countries of, of Africa. And I think we are very excited to everybody like that. And to everyone who attended here, I really appreciate your time. And I'm so excited to, to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Jackson. This, is, this was really, really exciting. Thank you for giving us a glimpse of, um, of the work you're doing. Um, and it's interesting for me, I'm always, every time I attend these uh, webinars, I'm always um, amazed by the amount of good work, good knowledge that, um, that science in Africa in general is, is generating. And it's really, really inspiring. So um, I think we can go ahead with questions. Um, 
there's um so i think what would be easier is if you have a question you can just uh say i have a question in the comment section and then i'll give you the floor you can unmute and ask the question so um tendani let me know if you want to ask this question you had live or i can just read it i can read it out for you um if you're still online let me know hi afternoon and thank you um i think you can just read it out um i think i can ask prof if i've got a follow-up question thank you yeah I'm here go, okay. uh, yeah go ahead and ask both questions um tendani if you uh, from this one i think um the first one was um what let me see so he was curious about levels of lox5 and lta 4h in other lung diseases um and then if you've seen any literature that looked at such and also levels in acute versus chronic disease phase um and then and then you can just ask your follow-up question with that uh, and then he'll answer together great is that from tendani the question Y yes, that's okay. the thank you, question. thank you, thank you, Tendani. So Tendani, we used to do gym together many years ago at grad school. So, but it's working in the same space. So, I've, so I've gone through the first. I've gone through the list of you know attendance, and I'm very excited to see many faces that I I appreciate, and I know also colleagues in working space as well in different areas. So to answer the question about locks and LTA for H, for example. Uh, um, abundance in various forms of the disease before the stages. So yes, so that's a very good question because some of these things that mirror inflammation, it could be generalized inflammation that's not only TB specific. For instance, if if um, if one is going to claim that LOX5 is actually a, a TB phenomenon, it goes up because TB alone, and then you target that inflammation, so, so one would actually have to understand whether there are other underlying diseases that might be driving that inflammation associated with LOX5. So, Tendani, so at the moment, I don't, many studies haven't really looked at LOX5, but I think um, going up, but what I can tell you that's very interesting is that an, 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 a, a pharmaceutical inhibitor of LOX5 is called xylitin. So it's actually in clinical trials for, for asthma. So I don't know the mechanism and what led to the clinical trial, like I think it's even phase three now, I'm not sure. But the clinical trial is on the basis of the, the I don't know whether it's actually the airway inflammation and so on, which indicates that ALOX5 already could be a potential generalized inflammation mediator. That's not specific for TB. So it's just one example. So that's a very interesting question and thanks for bringing it up. And another thing about LOX5 severity to the disease, you mentioned whether it, at the different stages of the disease it changes. Is that the question? So, um, yes, think, that is the question, Prof. Yeah. So severity of the disease in ours is, I didn't check whether severity in our case is actually TB, latent TB, and no TB. But the real, I think, the real uh, measure of severity for me is if one would look across the spectrum of TB, even the subclinical level before the arrival of the disease and see whether there are changes even earlier on. So that would be very interesting studies to do, but those are expensive because you follow people who are latently infected, and then along the way you see those who convert and you see what happens. You take blood throughout, and then you see what happened retrospectively in that blood shortly before TB came. And then you can see whether actually those were markers of changes earlier on. But at the moment, uh, it's, it seems to be a marker of disease, TB, disease active TB. But severity over at various stages of the disease, we haven't done it. Thanks for the questions. Thank you. Um, Leopold, um, you had a question. You can go ahead and ask. ask. You might be mute. Uh, yeah, um, look, but I, are you still online? Oh yeah. So we can't hear you, probably your internet, uh, but I can see you're not on mute. Okay, so 
so we can't hear you. Um, I don't know if you can just type the question. Is there anyone else who wants to ask um, a question right now? Let me see. Um, okay. Anyway, so before anyone else sees interest, so um, so you talked about uh, Jackson. I'll just ask a, a, a simple question for me. Sure. You talked sure. about how you're exploring um, to see if the the any other uh, is it drugs that um, have been used in other uh, therapies um, to see if they can actually support this. So I've seen the same being used in in cancer. There's like a, a researcher here in Rwanda who who did. Um, but he did it in the US. So um, how long does it um, take to be able to, to discover if a certain drug can be able to, to cross support therapy in different diseases? And, and, and in particular for TB, um, do you think um, the same way you're looking at the ones that are actually supporting ther therapy for TB, are there other ones that may make it very hard for any therapy that is developed to hinder development and, and, and all that? Yeah, so, yeah, I mean, that's a good question, as you said, and I think it's an area that I think first, as you said, how long is very difficult, you know, <laughs> other than going through testing, but what's excite, exciting, it won't be as long a process as it is at the moment in terms of developing new drugs that have never been tested before. As you know, when you develop a new drug, um, I'm not really in pharmacology, but my understanding is that you develop a potential molecule that is actually a lead or a hit, and then you actually have to check toxicity in mammalian cells and going small, small animal models that needs approval ethically. And then from there, you go to first clinical trial, second and so on, and the approval to be honest, if you start with trying to develop a new drug today and you want to see it on a shelf, everything followed, you're probably going to take 15 years. All this FDA approval and so on. So the shorter, shorter part of how long it takes to develop this, the advantage is that these are molecules that are approved now. They are drugs that are approved by FDA for a different disease. And that disease is a secondary effect in a disease like TB. For example, inflammation is secondary effect in, in the lung, for example. So developing it actually is, a, is more testing as a proof of concept and actually doing clinical trials that would actually just to show its work and then show that it doesn't have detrimental effects. So I think the process on paper shouldn't be that long. And also because it's a safer space to work on and you don't worry about resistance, you don't worry about all these kind of things, but it's, it's a normal process to try and develop the drugs because you want to be testing in a different condition. So there has to be robust methods, robust statistics all in place. So yeah, so, so to answer your question, I think, yes, those directed therapies have benefits in that they are already approved and then you already understand mechanism of action. And you mentioned Kens, I have to say that Kens has been advanced for a long time in terms of research that has been going for a very long time. Well, that remains a problem, but there's a lot of discoveries that we can learn from, for instance, in TB that have been used as therapies in cancer, like in signaling. I showed you one molecule that has to do with signaling, for example. So there are other molecules that I didn't show you today, just I picked examples that are actually more associated with cancer, for instance. And we found that we see when TB lung damage changes. So, so we, yeah, so, so, so we can learn a lot from cancer, for instance, and also all the things you mentioned, they are really, really exciting that even in Rwanda, they have people looking into those. I don't know if I answered all your question. Yeah, I think, I think that's, that's really answers, answers most of it, the essence of it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So if we go back to the question of Leopold, so he just um, put it um, here and he said um, that this talk is in the same week where there's a publication on the finding of single cell TB granuloma profiling showing lymphocyte, lymphocyte CD4 and CD8 presence. Mm. So, and, so then um, the question is, did you look at phenotype of cell in your granuloma and how do you make use of the, this new insight from granuloma of 
macaque. I think that's how they say it. Yeah. Say, yeah, it's macaque. Okay, wow. Thanks, Leopold. Again, some like, um, as I mentioned, like this great colleague. So, Leopold is a TB researcher from Gambia and London. <laughs> but a good friend from from <laughs> from the field. So so nice thing about TB area, people work as a lot of collaborations and so on. So I have great respect for people in here. Thanks, Leopold, for the question. So uh, yes, so I I didn't read the paper that came out on macaque granulomas that's showing the single cell, actually, particularly CD8s and CD4s. But that's very interesting, also looking at phenotypes of. Uh, of the cells. So as, as, as you could hear from my talk, our school of thought is that like lymphocytes are in the so-called lymphocytic cuff on that granuloma that I showed that it's more things that are in the periphery. But one of the things I actually think we might have at this point, but one of the things that we've always wanted to know is how the cells communicate. For instance, people believe that macrophages are activated by T cells that release interferon gamma and interferon gamma activates macrophages to try and kill bacteria. But in a granuloma, we always thought CD4 T cells and CD8s are in the lymphocytic cuff outside in macrophages at the center and in between these fibroblasts. So one would actually question how is the communication network between the cells occurring and so on. So a single cell, I'm glad that it, uh, they sort of address that. But for me, I would also be very excited that if we match single cell, now this is to answer a question about how this influences our thinking now. So I would be really interested if you also go in situ, go back to the tissue that's still intact, and you look at the dynamics of communication between cells and migrate, migrate through patterns, for example, of chemokines and so on. But that's a beautiful work, and thanks for highlighting that. Uh, I sort of have an idea of who it comes from, and I'll go and read, but I'll appreciate the, yeah, I'll appreciate the thoughts if you have more thoughts about this. I don't know if it answers your question. So, um, um, yeah, so I, I think um, the next question is from um, Shaku. Um, and then, so he, I hope it's, um, so I, I don't know if it's uh, he or she, but um, they're asking if, um, about your other recent work uh, that they've seen about um, trained in innate immunity induced by BCG. So the question is, if you'll be testing in mice or monocytes and do you think transposon mutagenesis is a better platform than CRISPR? Oh, um, wow. <laughs> yeah, and then, um, and then the other question around them was, uh, so they thought you were going to talk about the TNCEQ study in this talk. So I don't know if that makes sense. Okay. Um, Yes, and then after this, yes. Elizabeth. So, Mari, Mari, thank you so much. So, yes, Mahari is also a colleague in the field, also working, I think, with Prof. Bavesh Kana, right, on TB2. So, Mari, thanks, and I always appreciate your sharing of, of work in, on Twitter. Um, so, it's um, the question of TNC. Yes, as you can imagine, this is completely different because I talked more of the host, but I didn't know that anyone knew that we have interest in that, but we recently got a grant, as you mentioned, from Gates Foundation, looking at how we can identify genes utilized by the bacteria that cause TB. How can we, we, we target those genes that help the bacteria survive the immune system? Because arguably the bacteria know how to survive our immune system, because even if someone has competent immune system, they still have bacteria in the lung. So what are the mechanisms utilized by bacteria? So the TNC project is actually looking at those. But then we further take it to see whether we can use those genes to really see whether the same genes utilized by MTB or new genes can be, can be uh, are they used by the bacteria to survive an immune system in immunized people, for example. If they do, then we would know that we can disarm the mycobacterial mechanisms to and then we can increase the efficacy of vaccines. That's how the project is. Um, I think you had a question, so I'm not sure about the actual question, but I just wanted to give it brief uh, because, um, yeah, I wasn't talking about the project itself. And as you know, we haven't really started on the work, so so that's why. <laughs> yeah. So I think I think the question was whether you'll be testing in mice or monocytes, and oh. also if you think. Um, Transposon mutagenesis is better is a better platform than CRISPR. Oh yeah, so um, personally, so uh, some of the colleagues that work in the lab are here, and then for instance, Kerry, for instance, has done a lot of CRISPR 
so CRISPR for us is, um, in, I mean, like, I, I understand you talking about knockdown in the TB, the system like the Jeremy system. Um, uh, so, so I, Jeremy Rock system. I think for screening, uh, TNC allows you to identify things that are, in this case, we are actually identifying things that are conditionally essential. So these are genes that are not essential for bacterial survival, but they are only essential when the bacteria is subjected to a stressful condition. So TNC, I think, has been the best tool, but also, as you know, like maybe I could say, as you know, Eric Rubin, uh, my, uh, my collaborator on the project, is one of the found, fa founders of TNC, and then we, I'm familiar with TNC myself, so I'm biased towards TNC in terms of identifying those and works well. So CRISPR is very exciting and it's developing, but while I also knew that there were issues of off-target in mammalian cells, for example, when I tried it and so on. But I think CRISPRs, you know, they even won a Nobel laureate, I mean, Nobel Prize and everything with the work. Everyone appreciates how the advent of CRISP, the, the, the CRISP, CRISPR-Cas9 has actually sort of changed our way of looking into gene editing and is promising to do more. But I think there's still a lot of things that need to go into the technology. But at bacterial level, if I were to choose two, I would absolutely choose, um, I would choose TNC. I would do it again on TNC level, if you just want an answer on that, yeah. Yeah, definitely. I think it's all about maturity of the, of the technology and for specific sure. you want to, to, to use it for. So next question, Elizabeth, I think you, you said that you have a question. You want to go ahead? Yes, yes. Um, hello. Can you hear Hi. me? Hi, Elizabeth. Yes. Can okay. hear you. Um, all right. Good afternoon and um, thanks for the talk. Um, I was wondering, um, I think at some point you mentioned using the macrophage system for some aspect of your in vitro work. I stand to be corrected, but I thought I heard that. Where you said true. it's not. Yeah, and you followed up with, um, it may not be the best model. So I was wondering why did you use that all the same? And once if it's not the best model to use once the data okay. be not valid and weren't there other better models to to you could have used? That's that's what I want to ask. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. I really appreciate the question. It's good to meet you. You want me to be honest, an honest answer, or you, you want a scientific answer? Because there's an honest answer why I just decided to choose macrophages. Okay. Not mice. You can. You could give both. You could give both. Okay. It would be interesting. Honest, honest answer at the beginning. I actually wrote a grant proposing to validate these things in mice, and then I went to. I wrote to to a big grant, and then people sort of reviewers actually crashed mice model that more granular mice more granulomas were not similar to so they started unpacking the structure of a granuloma in human and to see whether actually can actually follow if you realize a lot of my studies were based on on spatial segregation of these events during disease progression so that was highly crushed on mouse but i i knew but then mouse would develop would be a tool to use when you do drugs over time in the overall symptoms of the disease which are not similar to humans for example mice people would say they don't cough and so on. But I think mouse is a very good tool for people to understand parameters of the disease at various level, like bacterial load, lung inflammation. But if it's specifically for a granuloma, for instance, it becomes very difficult that you cannot actually see similar granulomas. So I'm being crushed by that, I wanted to simplify my project because I just wanted to do targeting and stuff like that. And then, as they say, once bitten, you know, twice shy, right? So I... Next time I wrote a grant, I said, okay, I'm not going to include mouse to validate human stuff. I'll use a human uh, surrogate cell cell um, cell line called THP macrophages that are come from human, for instance, which I think I would, I would motivate that they're easy to manipulate, that we can do gene knockouts. But I'm not going to present it as an absolute model that recapitulates and represents everything that's happening in the lung, but I'm going to okay. represent it as a first start and I still agree. I mean, like if one way to say what are the better models, now there's 3D models that people are doing. There's organoids. There's also things like uh, multi-layer 
multicellular culturing, like one could actually have like, like uh, what we call this endothelial cells in an upper layer, bottom layer can have macrophages sort of mirror the interaction. But I, I think those things are still would not represent the real mush work, the network of cells that are happening in the lung. So my former boss, one of my former bosses used to say the best model for TB is humans because the human TB is unique as it is. Humans cough, mice don't cough, like humans have a structured granuloma, mice don't have, and humans have multiple. So, so if you really want to get events, it's human itself, that's why we use human tissues. But in terms of dynamics, I think mouse and other models could actually provide such a tool. And macrophages, in terms of the way I wanted to address the question of causality alone, I think it sort of helps us do that alone. But I'm not claiming mice are really, I mean, macrophages are perfect. So to tell you the truth, the perfect model now, I think closest to humans, macaques, I think, People who are doing macaques work, they are very expensive. Like these are non-human primates, ethics granted. They are also very expensive to do, but they have similar structure to, to, to humans. Um, and then, and also, I mean like mice, there's also mice called Kremnik mice strain that also are close and so on. So no, no model, no one could actually say this model is not the best and so on. They all actually combine as a general tool that we'll use to address these diseases and together doing research, you contribute in different ways, yes. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I think uh, the next question is got from Mosike. I hope I pronounced your name. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you pronounce it well. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Hi. Thank you, Doug, for the wonderful presentation. It's Good a to pleasure. See you. <laughs> yes, uh, your presentation was quite very educational. Uh, I thought it was going to be too technical, <laughs> but I was able to follow through some of the things. Then uh, I saw that some of the, the treatment therapies that you are working on is mainly with TB. Then I was, uh, I was I just got curious and one that in patients that maybe have other co-infections like HIV, because usually TB goes with HIV, these treatment therapies, will they follow the same routes? Will they, will they be deviation in terms of how they work? Also knowing that HIV has also its inflammatory component. So will, will, it, uh, will it be diverse if you are just mainly working with only HTB or TB and HIV? Will there be deviations? Will they be great and stuff? Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Mr. K. It's good to see you, and always it's great to exchange ideas with you. Uh, so, so yeah, your question is valid. So, when one does, so we are working uh, at the moment, working specifically with TB, and of course, as I mentioned, we are at R. We also work on TB and HIV infection and so on. Mm. So, so at the moment, for the samples that we have been doing to check for the for the molecules that I showed you alone today. It was in an HIV negative environment. So we don't know what the effect of HIV would be on the performance of these molecules at the level of inflammation. But surprisingly, I think, I think when someone, um, for me, I think when someone really has HIV treatment, they are on suppressed level. I think, um, like, I feel like that's mm -hmm. fine. This, this mm -hmm. like this. It's just, to me, it's like the same as healthy. Mm. Um, it's just healthy. So, I mean, as you know, maybe, maybe a little debating. So, I think the advent in the HIV world, in the HIV field, we really have to admire the progress that has been done with how actually ART now is actually like in over 92% in some studies. That people who, if you stick to treatment, you are healthy mm. and people can make lifelong. So, there's no difference anymore. Where mm. So, at the level of inflammation, if one is not on treatment, for example, yeah. One, so there's a study that I was involved with that looked at tissues from people who are, who are, um, so it's an author, I was with orthopedic surgeons. So we're looking at tissues that come from spine, sort of TB. So mm. funny enough, people who are HIV positive, they have less damage. They have, they had, but those who are not in treatment, mm. they had less damage than those who had, when HIV positive, were HIV negative. Mm. which are surprising. So the less damage comes from the fact that if you have less CD4 cells, for example, so CD4 T cell mediated mm. responses can be inflammatory itself. Mm. They actually have some depletion of those cells, 
by default, the general inflammation can go down and there could be less damage, for instance. So mm. I think in the context of HIV, it's when you design studies related to TB, I mean, factors that are underlying, like also HIV, it's normal to include that or include to look at the effect, but it'd be interesting how they perform. And that's the idea to check since we're in the R environment. The idea is to check how the operates. Mm. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Okay. Thank you. So um, I can see there's no one else who um, who has any questions. So so then uh, just before we close, um, Jackson, tell me, like from your research or in general, uh, based on the on the research of your other colleagues or other anyone else doing research around TB, um, what is what are some of your expectations in the few years around um, research coming out around TB? What do you expect to be some of the breakthroughs that we may foresee or see coming coming through in the in the next few years? Well, thanks, Esther. I mean, that question is not necessarily talking about coming from my lab, right? Because that would be... <laughs> uh, let, let's hope it's coming from your lab, but again, I, in, just I, in general. Or maybe, I don't think, in fact, I shouldn't be using, using my lab, because I think global world, we just have one lab, right? Working together in competition. Mishik, I think you you are you are you are on mute. Can you please mute yourself? Hi, yeah, yes. So so as I was saying, I mean like um the things that have to come out definitely have to be things linked to the current challenges. And when I started here, I talked about why if we were to to meet our ambitious plan of eradicating TB by 2035, for example, or in our lifetime that we want, we want to make sure that there's no longer TB, strategies have to change um, and, or, or not change per se, but new strategies have to come to place. But urgency, as I mentioned, as we learned from COVID-19, that when you are serious as a world, you come together and you identify a challenge as your own, all of you, and there's so much advocacy and resources at your disposal and so much awareness. So that urgency, I think if you could have it with TB, I believe you could eradicate TB. And signs of eradication would come from, I think this biggest, I don't work on vaccines per se directly, but I think a vaccine would be the first because new cases develop all the time, right? So if you can manage to get a vaccine that's efficient, that future generations won't have TB because they are vaccinated, that would be the first to eradication. So what I look forward to coming in the next few years is actually a vaccine that's proven to work with high efficiency that actually also have good efficacies and is protective. And not only in children, but also, but also in adults. So with good memory, as they say, like uh, Im immune memory. So that's one. Next, I think one thing, one thing that has been coming quite a lot now is biomarkers, which are actually like proteins I showed you, for instance, biomarkers that tell that there's a disease or there's no disease. But those have been really quite advanced into a kit that one can just utilize at point of care, which means you go out to communities, you just take a hand prick like the way we do with HIV. HIV work is advanced and you can see the changes from 1983 to now. I mean, like now, I think, they, like, to be honest, I think research has done very, very well in the context of HIV, looking at diagnostics, looking at the treatment. And then the TB, we still, like, over centuries, we're still not even having perfect diagnostics for earlier time. We have treatment, but they're still marred with resistance. But we still take decades to come with a new drug and so on. So I think the strategies to come with diagnostics, biomarkers, that are actually now translating into a kit that's just available that someone can just print somewhere in a village and they shall look at the presence of a particular gene or the levels like the way we do with interferon for latent TB. So I think translating into a lot of work that's, that we have in biomarkers, translating that into a working point of care kit that should be coming out soon, that would be nice. And then lastly, I think because um, with, like, I like host-directed therapy so much, so I think in the next few years, probably where we, all of us could also contribute, I think we should have a lot of host-directed therapies that are targeting inflammation coming out. 
So those are three things. And finally, I think at general level, I think we should actually be having policies and advocacy that's at population level, that's really taking things to discover in the lab serious, that they should also have to make it to the next level and incorporate it into policies that will shape our healthcare systems. Definitely, definitely agree with, with the last point because uh, what I've seen, and especially with the COVID lessons, is yeah. um, creating a di direct link from the lab to, to policy, to healthcare, um, implement health, healthcare policy implementation really um, improves how much people are coping with a certain disease or how fast um, we create an, a, an environment that enables um, things to move fast really. So thank you. I don't think I have any question. I don't think we have any last question. So I'll just say thank you. Thank you for, for coming for this talk. Thank you for everyone. I can, I can make a shout out to my mom because I saw that she just joined. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> anyway, yes. thank you. Well, yeah, but thanks, everyone. I really appreciate the time you made. And, and, and I'm sorry if I sounded like two in terms of the questioning, the answering of questions. I just wanted to make it casual. <laughs> so, no. so I, really, I really appreciate everyone who made it to the talk. And I hope we'll continue having conversations like this and working together to solve challenges that are relevant to Africa. Yeah, definitely. Thank you so much. Um, so we'll be uploading this on YouTube for everyone else. So when you upload it, I hope everyone who attended you is going to share with their friends so that we can all benefit from the knowledge. Uh, thank you again, Jackson, for, for sharing your knowledge and the research you're doing. Um, I wish among the top three things that you've shared, some of them are actually going to come from you and your lab. Okay. <laughs> so, thank you, thank yeah. you. Thank you, Einstein Forum, too, and you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Have a great evening, everyone. Um, bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.